All right, in this lesson, we'll want to randomly instantiate enemies when a trigger is reached, a trigger being pretty much just like any collider, but with a slight difference. We'll want to set player and enemy interactions, specifically the part that has to do with dealing damage and possibly handle ad force a bit better. And we'll want to keep track of score, awarding score based on damage done to the enemies, and also have a difficulty level, which will determine the number of enemies that are instantiated when the trigger is activated. All right, so we'll start this lesson first by creating a couple of, uh, couple of methods for the enemies class. One will be a border hit check method, which will basically just check if the enemy has hit the borders of the screen and keep it within the bounds of the screen rather than fly off. And the other method will be uh, destroy when out of bounds method. So if the enemy happens to somehow get out of bounds, it'll just destroy it. So let's add those methods to the enemy class the base enemy class in enemies.cs. Alright, so we can just add it anywhere. I'll add it here. So we'll say protected void, call it border hit check. We'll want a float, we'll call force to be passed in when we call this method. And we'll basically use the uh, speed of the enemy to calculate that force. So we'll say force equals force times speed. We can just say times equals then, times equals speed. And we'll want a vector three for enemy position, which will store based on the camera.main world to viewport point method. We'll pass in the transform position for the enemy. And we'll simply have a couple conditionals here to handle if it's at the edge of the screen, then add the force if that is the case. So we'll say if enemy position dot x is less than zero, so left edge of the screen, uh, we'll say body dot velocity equals new vector two. And we'll make sure it stops dead first. So we'll say velocity of zero on the X axis, and then just pass in the existing Y velocity for the Y axis. Do the add force to push it back into play basically. So add force new vector Two, we'll give it the force value that we determine above and zero for the Y, not adding force to the Y axis. And we'll say it's going in a positive direction, right? So to the right, in other words. And we'll say else if enemy position dot x is greater than one, so the right hand side of the screen. We'll say pretty much the same here. I'm gonna kind of repeat this code, unfortunately. Hate doing that, try not to, but in this case, we're just gonna repeat it so we can set this value. So it's going in a negative direction to the left, as well as here, the force is gonna to be to the left. All right, and now we'll create the destroy when out of bounds method as well. So we'll say protected void destroy out of bounds. And that'll be pretty simple. Basically just a single conditional. We'll say if transform position dot y is less than minus six, so six units below the floor essentially, or uh, actually six units below the center point, I think. I can't remember exactly. I think it's below the center point. We'll destroy the game object. So game object dot destroy the game object through the property that refers to it. All right. 
And now we'll want to incorporate these methods and all the uh, enemy classes, the different enemy classes. Some will maybe not use the uh, border hit check method and otherwise they might also get different force values applied. That's why I passed in this, uh, had this parameter passed in for that. So let's just call these now in the individual enemy classes, starting with bouncer. So after movement pattern or whatever, you put it right here, border hit check with a force of 50 and we'll call destroy out of bounds. I'll just copy this so I can paste it in for the rest of the enemies. And for the Gigantor, it will be, we'll just have the destroy when out of bounds method. Because for this one, we don't really, it's going to be moving really slowly, so we don't really care if it kind of veers off to the edge. It's going to take up a lot of space. So it's not that important for this enemy type. Same thing for the ghost, because it can pretty much move freely anywhere. So just the destroy out of bounds method. And for lush, we'll border hit check with a value of 20. For torque, will be border hit check with a value of 80. And for tweaker, it will be border hit check 50 as well. All right, so now we'll also want a world manager script, which will have uh, the score and the difficulty level set in. So go to scripts world folder and create a world manager script. And before I forget, might as well attach it to the main camera. So for this, we'll have a public statically accessible level, oops, int for level. We'll also have, we'll have a property for the difficulty level, which we'll see why in a moment. So we'll say for the backing field, private static int underscore difficulty and then the public static int uppercase D difficulty difficulty and we'll just simply get the level that we have so we'll return level divided by three so with every three increments of our level that we're at, we'll have basically one more uh, difficulty level, which will result in one more enemy being spawned at the trigger, which we'll deal with shortly. And so in awake, we'll say void awake, set the level to start off with at three, so we get at least one enemy to start off with. And might as well set this now. This is going to be, uh, we'll have the target frame rate at 60, which again, we can reduce that for testing. And we also want to have the V-Sync at zero. Now, when we finally build this project, you're going to want to set the V-Sync to one, enabled in other words. And that's just to make sure that there's no weird anomalies like screen tearing with the sprites or uh, jitteriness. So make sure to do that, uh, which I think we'll do in the last lesson coming up here. So say application dot target frame rate equals 60 and quality settings for now the vsync count for this to work in the editor so we can see this one testing set to zero I got a little comment here just so you remember we don't even need update that's it for the world manager for now all right, now in enemy's factory, we'll create a trigger collider on a wake. So we'll create it in code. You can also do it in the inspector by setting a collider as a trigger. So a trigger collider is the same as any kind of collider, except that 
it basically has this one difference. It recognizes a collision, uh, collision event between two collidable objects once when they enter each other. Uh, so basically it triggers, it sets a flag when the colliders intersect. Uh, whereas if it's not a trigger, there's basically a continuous collision event being read over and over again as those colliders are colliding, right? Or interacting, in other words. So let's sit our trigger collider right now in the enemy's factory script. So this is actually going to be moved to another method. Well, actually, we'll put it into the on trigger enter 2D method, which is pretty much the analog of the uh, on collision enter 2D method, but for particularly for a trigger. So we'll just say, you have to make sure the spelling is exactly as this. So on trigger enter 2D, we'll say collider 2D with the argument input parameter, in other words, is defined as other for other collider. All right, and now for the actual, for the awake method that we have now, we'll just set up the trigger collider. Box collider 2D, the local name of collider. We'll assign to it game object dot add component method. Give it a box collider 2D. And of course, we'll want to set it as a trigger, so we'll access the collider through its local name. So is trigger is a bool, and we'll say it's true. And we'll set the collider values, the offset and size, by saying collider.offset equals new vector two with an offset of zero and five, and then collider dot size equals new vector 2 0.5 f for x and 9.5 f for y so that will result in a collider that's kind of in the middle of the screen kind of in the middle extending from the floor all the way to the top so you can't avoid it once you reach once you reach the middle of the screen all right we're going to want to detect the player the cheese head game object when it enters this collider. So we'll want tag cheese head as being on the player layer for the collision layer, or sorry, tag layer, I should say. All right, I'm gonna just want to temporarily move this code so we can have a clean starting point here. We're gonna to want to reinsert this later. So I'm just gonna put it here and then later on copy and paste it. Might as well fix this. All right, so we'll set up now our on trigger enter 2D method. So when a trigger is achieved, when our player enters the trigger, we're gonna need to check that. So if other, the other collider through this parameter that we've input gets input when the event occurs. If other dot game object dot tag is equivalent to player, then and only then do we actually set off the sequence. So we'll say destroy destroy the collider so that we can't recollide with it again once we exit it and enter it back in. In the destroy method, we'll just pass in get component get the collider 2D. This is on the floor game object once again, so it will be, yeah, there's no existing collider, so it'll be the one that we're creating from the awake method here. So get the collider 2D and destroy it. will increase the level, so every time we create a new floor game object, the level will go up, which again will result in more enemies over time. So say world manager.level plus plus. 
All right, so now we'll instantiate the enemies based on the level by creating a for loop, and we'll go through that level number, and each time it goes through that loop, it'll instantiate a new random enemy. So we can handle it like this, for int i equals zero, if i is less than, than world manager dot difficulty, so i plus plus, this will be the, the for loop that does all the magic. And we'll want to start with a int random instance variable. That'll just be a random range, zero to five basically, exclusive of the second input, which is six. It's kind of curious that they have it that way. I always get confused still to this day. Uh, but yeah, it's zero to five for five enemies. So any one of them. And we'll say float random x. So for the position, we'll randomize that as well. So we'll say the transform position of the floor game object. And you know, plus or minus six units. So basically around the edges of the screen. So we'll say six times random range. Do this minus one or one multiplier bit of code we've been doing quite a bit of and also going to want to wrap that around just to make it a little readable and let's say for random y random range 48 on the y-axis all right so random instance is going to have a random number from 0 to 5 so what we could do is we could have a set of if then clauses and sort of check the number and if it's 1 do this if it's 2 do that and so on and so forth but uh, for this we're going to use something called a switch statement, which is very similar to an if statement. I'll mention how they're different in a moment, but it's a little bit better used in this circumstance. So say switch, and then we'll pass in random instance here. It's gonna need those curly braces. So within the scope of the switch statement, case zero. So if it's zero, that's the, uh, the number for random instance through this iteration of the for loop. Put a colon after that, and we'll just put a comment for now. We'll say uh, gigantor. So we'll just remember to put the gigantor uh, information there. I'm just showing you right now how the uh, switch statement works. And then we have to use the break keyword to break out of the switch statement. So that's necessary. Also, just keep going. Case one, we'll say tweaker break. Case two, lush break. Case three, bouncer break. Case four, torque break. Case five, it'll be the last enemy that we have, ghost. And one final break. All right, so that's a switch statement. And in its simplest usage, which is basically how we're using it here, uh, it's basically like an ordinary conditional that checks for different possibilities or cases for a single variable or operand, right? So if, if this were instead a set of if statements, it would read something like, if random instance is equivalent to dot, 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 else if random instance is equivalent to dot, 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 else if random instance is equivalent to, 
so on and so forth. So that's just a lot of redundancy and repetition. So in this case, using a switch statement to check for multiple cases uh, for the single operand is just a little bit more easier and more logical and easier to read. So, so now we'll actually wanna have the instantiating code inserted here for each of these cases. So we have the Gigantor first, Giant George, we'll take that. We have the tweaker, take that. Good old Lushy Linda. Can't forget about Lushy Linda. And the bouncer. Torquey Tom. and ghostly gale and we'll no longer need this little temp method i created just so that there's no red squiggly lines and error messages while we were waiting to use that bit of code and for the positions we were testing before just at the middle of the screen basically so now what we can do is we can use the randomized uh variables that we created here so the new vector three will be positioned at random x. So through each iteration, this is gonna be different for each enemy. Random y, and pass in one for z value. I'll just copy and paste these throughout here. And that's that. All right, now back to the Unity editor. Go to Project Settings, Physics 2D. We'll make sure that the cheese head and eyeball can interact, right? That's important. And no longer want that fist there ahead of our cheese head. That was just for visual, uh, seeing that in the, in, in the editor. So we'll just change the position of the cheese head fist to start off with to its normal position, which is zero on the X axis. And I want to change some uh, properties of the stomper as well. The box collider will have it have these values. We we'll want to give it a rigid body 2D. And so it doesn't affect our cheese head, push them around or, or whatnot, make sure the stomper is kinematic. We'll set to interpolate and freeze rotation for Z. All right, back in code, we're gonna to want to properly set up uh, collision events now between the enemies and the player as well as deal damage and have hit points and so on so let's do that first by going to our enemy class the base class yet again and we'll have a hit points integer variable or a field that's going to be inherited by each enemy type and have its own hit points value given. So we'll say protected int HP. And for each enemy, starting with bouncer here, in start method, we'll set its, H, its hit points. So HP equals one, so most of them will have one. I'll just copy this and paste it in the other start methods for the other enemies. Ghost is gonna have one. J 
Gigantor is going to take a little bit more to take down, so we'll give it three hit points. Three hits it will take. And for Lush, it'll be one. For Torque, it will be two. And for Tweaker, it will be one as well. Now let's set how the enemies take damage by giving each enemy a do damage method again in the base class because they'll all have the same do damage method just the amount of damage that we do might be different so we'll say this will be a publicly accessible method so we'll say public void do damage pass in a damage amount when it's called, for example, when our fist interacts with the game with the uh, enemy, we'll pass in the amount of damage we're doing, and we'll simply take away some hit points. So minus equals damage amount assigned to the hit points, and we'll also say if hit points is less than or equal to zero, we'll destroy this enemy through the game object property reference. Now when we attack an enemy, we want to sort of push it away a bit and do the damage and also ward us some points. So in the world manager, we'll want to set a public static score. So public static int score. And so let's get this all to work by starting out in the attack controller. In the on collision enter 2D method, we'll want to modify this a bit. So we'll just take this out. We'll start, start again. So we'll grab the enemy through the call parameter passed in here. We'll say call.gameObject.get component get the rigid body component and immediately assign it to a local rigid body 2d variable called enemy it's lowercase b uh, zero the enemy's velocity so that it doesn't just add force to the existing x or y velocity so this will make it a more consistent pushback when we collide with our fist or or otherwise collides with our enemy so we'll say new vector 2 zero it out and then we'll apply the add force enemy dot add force new vector 2 and we'll do what we had before with player state dot instance uh, direction facing times tack force for x and then tack force for y. We'll do force mode impulse yet again. Oh. Need another parenthesis there. And we'll also do the damage through the enemies do damage method. So get component, get the, the attach script component. This is kind of interesting the way we're doing this. So pay close attention to this. We'll grab the enemy script component and select the do damage. So with this attack method, we'll, we'll do two points of damage. So the fist will do more damage than the projectile make sure the projectile does less damage 
and then we'll add to our score. So world manager dot score plus equals 200. All right, can you take a guess as to why I said that this is interesting the way that we're grabbing the enemy script component? Well, it's because we're using polymorphism here, right? We're treating the enemy in particular uh, in question as just a base class enemy. We don't really care about the inherited version of it. Uh, we just want to get the enemy and run its do damage method. That's all we want to do. So this is a bit of an uh, uh, example of how polymorphism can be quite useful. Otherwise, it'd be a little bit difficult to, you know, try to figure out exactly what kind of script component is attached to the uh, enemy game object. Is it a ghost? Is it a bouncer? Is it a torque? You know, we don't know, right? We don't care, though. It's all we want is just to run its do damage method. Just treat it just as an enemy. They all have do damage method. So that's polymorphism right there. All right, now turning to the stomp controller, we don't even have to access do damage because it's going to be the most powerful attack in the game. So, you know, it's automatically destroying all enemies. It's going to be a kind of a difficult attack to achieve, a bit risky. So, all right, so we'll just change the bit so that we zero out our cheese head before he pops up into the air. So again, this is more consistent. So we'll say rigid body 2D, we'll get the cheese head's rigid body. Get component. We'll say cheesehead.velocity equals new vector two. And we'll for x pass in the cheesehead velocity dot x and zero at the y so we don't have a you know variable amount when we do the add force applied so he just pops up in the air at a consistent amount when we stomp on a enemy we zero it out and then we apply the add force so cheesehead dot add force say new vector two zero for x apply an add force of five we'll say force mode impulse Continue playing the audio source and also give us a score bonus. Since it's a difficult attack, we'll give a little bit extra. So 300 for this attack. All right, now in the projectile controller, our other attack, we'll do similar to what we did before. So we'll say rigid body 2D, get the enemy reference the rigid body 2d actually and we'll zero out its velocity and then do the add force we'll say enemy dot add force we'll say new vector 2 Convert to a float, the player state dot instance dot direction facing times 11 and then 14 on the y axis and force mode impulse. And also we'll want to do damage, so enemy dot get component, do the polymorphism again, grab the enemy component, script, and run do damage with a damage value of one this time. So the projectile being at a distance just is a little bit less damaging. It's a little more abusable, I guess you can say. And world manager score will give it lower score because of its ease of use. So we'll say 125 points. All right, one final thing we want to do is also set what happens when an enemy collides with our player, essentially killing the player, which will basically amount to disabling our ability to move or attack, as well as knock him out of the scene. So that'll be easily done. Go to the enemy base class. 
This will work the same with all enemies, doesn't matter which one. We'll have a void on collision enter 2D. Make sure you spell it right. A collision 2D call. So we'll say call dot game object dot get component. We'll grab the player controller. We'll disable it. So enabled equals false. And call dot game object dot get component get the rigid body. So we can apply the add force. New vector two, zero for X, 300 for X, or for Y I should say. And then we'll say call.gameObject.getComponent Collider 2D, get the Collider 2D and make sure it's disabled. So enabled equals false. And we'll also want to remove the, the fist and the stomper and such. So the easiest way to do that is just to iterate through them and delete them all with a simple for each loop. So for each, we'll say transform child in call.gameObject.transform. We'll destroy the child game object. All right, so that should be it. Let's now run and test it out. First, just make sure the collision, in fact, does basically kill our game object and the trigger works. So we hit the enemy and yep, we bounce out of the scene. Let's now try to destroy the enemy. First with a projectile. Hey, that works. Hey, and now with our fist, try to do this. Oh, it's not going to work with the ghost. We haven't set that up properly yet. All right, so let's do this again. This time checking if the fist is working correctly. Yep. All right, that's it for this lesson. In the next lesson, we'll finally look at how to create platforms being a platformer. It's kind of important, right? I'll see you there.